everyone. Thanks so much for joining us on this episode of Crypto Chicks Corner. I'm joined today by Nikki and Cami, and I'll let each of them kind of introduce themselves um, and tell us a little bit about their background and how they joined the Web3 community. Um, Cami, let's start with you. Okay, cool. Hi, thanks for having me on. I'm really excited. My name is Camila Ramos, but I just go by Cami most of the time, and I lead developer relations over at Fuel Labs. Um, I'm a longtime educator. I've been teaching computer science and coding stuff since maybe 2017 at this point. I taught K-12 computer science uh, through Boys and Girls Clubs for many years before starting my own nonprofit dedicated to that. And then I became an engineer at PayPal, where I worked on the checkout team for a bit before transitioning into DevRel, and then eventually making it into crypto full-time, where I still do developer relations. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. I didn't realize you had the education background. That's awesome. Um, Nikki. Hi, everyone. I think I'm uh, thank you for, for having me. Um, I'm Nicole Connor. I'm Argentinian. Um, well, I, I started uh, studying international trade, but uh, now I'm a community builder. Uh, and I change a little bit my profession. Um, I'm the co leader of Mujeres in Crypto. That's a community to, that helps to onboard new women into the ecosystem. And I'm also the Latin community manager of Metis. Yeah, thanks for joining. Um, so, so Cami, uh, I haven't gotten to meet you in person, but you met some of the the Metis team, I think, in Dev at DevCon, and they connected us for this podcast. Um, and I don't know if. Um, I mentioned this before, but I also used to teach. So it's really awesome that we have that K-12 background uh, that's similar. And Nikki just joined the Metis team to help grow um, our community in Latin America and help us kind of understand how to meet the needs of those community members. So I'm really excited to have you both on today to talk about that, but also just your experience as a developer and, um, you know, what kind of education and what the process looks like for someone to join Web3 um, specifically if someone wants to learn how to be a Web3 developer and they don't already have those tools. So um, how long, like when did you get started with coding? I started coding, okay, I wouldn't even say I started coding. I started learning about code in 2016, right before I graduated from high school. And I say, I wouldn't say I was coding, but I was more like just learning and kind of like taking classes and doing stuff online but I don't I wouldn't say I really started coding coding until like 2019 2020 when I started interning at PayPal um and this is actually a, a pretty core part of I think my story and who I am as, as an engineer at least and someone in tech is growing up I had never really known anyone who was an engineer I never really knew what it was I had never really heard of it <clears throat> but as I got older my plans for being a teacher, that's always what I wanted to be. I was like in sophomore year of high school or junior year. And I was like, okay, I don't know if this is really realistic to be a teacher in America in this day and age where you get paid really poorly. Like it's just not a great lifestyle. I was like, what else am I gonna do with my life if I can't be a teacher? So I was like, oh, I'll do something like social services or like, I don't know, social worker type of thing. Something that's still in that field. But then I kind of came coming back to the same conclusion. like. I don't know if this is going to be realistic for me. And growing up in the Bay Area in Silicon Valley, I knew that all the people who lived there who drove Teslas and who like lived in the bougie apartments worked in tech, but I didn't really know exactly what they did. Um, and then after kind of researching it and being like, all right, if they can afford to live here, live their bougie lifestyle, and I live here and I want to live a bougie lifestyle, I'm just going to do what they do. So I kind of decided to do computer science, not because I liked it or was really into it, but more so because I thought it would be a good career for me. And in high school, at the time when I had decided this, I was like, okay, I'm going to take computer science at my school, get ready for college. I'm going to apply for a CS major um, in a school of almost 3,000 students who were mostly Latino and Black. There were only 60 seats for computer science per year. So there were not even enough like resources for kids in these types of schools to try computer science because it's so restrictive in capacity that unless you win the lottery which is how they did it by a lottery 
then you would have to wait for the whole next year, next school year to try again, because in high school, it's a year based instead of semester based. So if you miss out, you have to wait a whole year. So that was kind of a turning point for me when that happened to me was like, I started looking into why this happens and kind of uncovered this whole thing around like structural racism, especially around computer science and like how it affects so many people and why there's not that many of us in tech and just how it's all connected. So that's kind of when I found like my thing where I was like, I'm not really passionate about CS, but I am passionate about equitable access to education. That's kind of where I was able to find my thing and really be passionate about what I was working towards, even though I wasn't like super in love with coding. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I I also was a teacher and found um, and, and even considered going into um, social work and like family community counseling after I left teaching because I was like, I still want to help people in this way, but I need a system that isn't so confined. Um, but obviously like social work was very similar. A lot of the problems were recreated. And so I think coming into the Web3 space and seeing all of these people who have these skills, um, but still the passion for helping people gives me hope that there's opportunity to develop new systems that really are equitable and really do support access to education and meaningful experiences beyond teaching kids how to have a job <laughs> and, and function in a society that's not serving its people. So um, yeah, you, totally. a little bit about your experience. Um, you, you talked a little bit about that some of the institutional racism that you felt you were seeing in, in the people who were being offered access to this education. Can you talk a little bit more about that and also your experience as a woman trying to break into a, a pretty male dominated industry? Yeah, um, it was a lot of, I would just say, feelings that were maybe not right, like people being explicitly racist, like, oh, you're, you shouldn't be in here. It was just much more, I mean, just like all racism or mo most racism, it's like kind of implicit and it's kind of just like felt rather than maybe spoken. Uh, so basically the worst feeling for me when I first started was I took this camp, it was like a summer camp. I was like 16 or 17, right about to finish college, I mean, high school. And I took this camp and it was on the UC Berkeley campus, but it was like an independent program for you know young people, kids. And I was in there and it was my very first coding class. It was the only coding experience I had outside of that like one experience that first introduced me to coding. And everyone in that class was Asian or white, every single person. And there were maybe like 30 kids in there. And it was like a different ages. There were like some kids I think as young as 12 and maybe some as old as 18. So there's a really wide kind of breadth of kids there, but they were all white or Asian. And I remember being there and being like, I kind of started to think and wonder like, am I smart enough for this? Is there a reason why no one looks like me? Are we just not built for this? And I remember just being so like upset and being like, I don't know if I can do this. And I even texted my mom and I was like, I don't know if I can do this. Like come pick me up. She's like, no, like you got this. Um, and so just like experiences like that. And then like being in college, when I went to college, it was kind of like a similar feeling of being in a classroom and no one looking like you. And maybe not being the only woman, but definitely being like one of two women and definitely there were no other Latinos. I think I was the only Latino person in my whole graduating uh, computer science class. And I went to a school that has a lot of Latinos and black students. I went to Cal State East Bay, which is like a very average public uh, uh, college. So it's like in the Bay Area where there's a lot of Latinos. Um, and then, yeah, as a woman, I mean, I think it's felt relatively um, welcoming and actually relatively easy. There are obviously like, those instances where you're like, well, that guy or that person is a dick. But I think for the most part, it's felt very comfortable and it's felt like I've had a lot of support along the way. Like at my first job, I had a woman manager and a lot of women around me who were like advocating for me and supporting me. And then um, in different jobs, I just felt like I was respected and I never really felt like that was a problem. So, and I know that's not, um, that might be like a more unique experience. So I'm grateful for that. Yeah, thank you for sharing those things. I I think it is the experience of like coming into this space um, and being 
unique either as like you're you're one of two women in a room or you're the only t- Latino in a classroom is is the community that you have behind you like supporting you through that process so um you felt it was a welcoming experience because you had women who were encouraging you and inviting you into that space and when I joined the crypto chicks and meet team I there were you know this is a, a woman founded organization so I already had that support but I have worked in an electrical engineering before um very briefly. And it was a completely different experience. I was the only woman in my office. And um, even though my title was like project manager, I was consistently given like flowers on administrative assistance day and called little lady and asked where my husband was at company events and things like that. So, um, and I've heard similar stories of women um, who are joining some of the more old school companies, but I think uh, by and large, it's definitely growing and getting better as far as uh, diversity in this space goes. And I'm really looking forward to talking more with you and Nikki about how um, we can support the developing community in Latin America. Um, Could you just, before we move into like what you're doing at Fuel Labs and kind of talking more about your role there, could you give some resources um, or just like favorite places to go and learn for anybody who's looking to get into Web3 or become a dev who doesn't have any coding experience? Yeah, for no coding experience, I think starting with something that's like a Web2 learning platform makes a lot of sense. I think a lot of educational content in Web3 has passed on kind of trying to reinvent the wheel and doing web two things. And I always say like, just use the resources that already exist because it's the same foundation. So something like free code camp or code.org or something like that would be a really good place to start. And then once you get into all the web three stuff that you can't find on those platforms, one thing that's I think is really good and I'm, maybe I'm biased is this website called 30 days of web three dot X, Y, Z. And it's a step-by-step course on building full stack dApps that walks you through every part of the stack. So it teaches you how to write a smart contract, how to write your indexing, how to write a front end, how to do off-chain storage, how to set up your wallet and all the good stuff. And the best part about it is that it was made for people who've never done it before. So it really walks you through every step of the way. And there's never a point where you get stuck and you're like, I don't know what to do because all the code is given to you and you just have to copy and paste and kind of learn how to do it. I'd also say another place to go, which is maybe less of a resource, but more of a community is something like Developer DAO, where it's a DAO just dedicated to developers and they're always working on educational initiatives that come out of there. So there could be something really good there too. Thank you for sharing. I'll make sure to put links to those resources that you shared in our show notes today. Um, okay, so tell us what's going on at Fuel Labs. You recently, um, so you're head of DevRel, but I saw that you're like chief vibes officer as well. So I want to hear about your role and then kind of the larger mission of what Fuel Labs is doing. Yeah, so officially I'm the head of developer relations. Uh, I'm also, I guess, the CBO. That was kind of more, more of a joke. The, the inside joke on that is that when we were at the offsite, or at least the first offsite that I was with them, we were all having dinner and I'm kind of like a very vibey person. So if I sense the good vibes, I want to like capture them. So I was kind of feeling everyone's good vibes. So I was like, let's just order some shots. So I started off with just like a round for our table. And then I kind of started seeing more people come and I was like, okay, let's do 10. Okay, let's do 20. Now let's do 50 shots. And then they ended up bringing like an entire bottle of shots for us. And that turned into our, basically our only group picture from that offsite. And I was kind of just like being like, see, see, like, look, look. And then uh, John, our CTO, I can't remember if it was Nick or John, either the CEO or the CTO was like, yeah, you, you have the title of CBO now for that. <laughs> That's funny. We, we have an offsite coming up soon and I'm really looking forward to getting some of that like casual interaction time with my team because it really does support collaboration and communication and builds trust, which is so important. Um, so I see like, you know, at Midas, which is a company that um, I also work for, is uh, an opt, well, we started off as an optimistic roll-up. We've kind of shifted toward a smart L2 now, but Fuel was kind of the first optimistic roll-up on Ethereum. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Fuel V1. Yeah, yeah. So how, how has, um, how's the model kind of evolved from there? So Fuel V1 was the first optimistic roll-up to put on Ethereum, but Fuel V1 only supported simple payments. 
So Fuel V2, which is what we're working on now, the team at Fuel Labs, <clears throat> Uh, Fuel B2 is um, Ethereum style smart contract. So basically the same thing you can do on Ethereum, but on Fuel. So before it was just simple payments. Now it's fully Turing complete smart contracts. Um, so that's kind of has been the change, but it was, it was planned like this from the start. Their Fuel V1 was kind of a proof of concept and they built it knowing that, okay, if this went well, that this was the next step. And it's really a lot of cool innovation I think we're doing that's different from a lot of L2s in the space, especially like the leading L2s in the space, I would say. We're taking, it feels like we're taking all the best parts of Ethereum and then adding on more things that other L2s, especially L2s that are EVM, couldn't do because they're constrained to EVM requirements. Awesome. I read something about how you're kind of moving away from a monolithic design. So consensus, data availability, and execution are all coupled. Um, and then you're looking toward more like separation of these, which allows for specialization. Could you kind of explain that for people who are not developers um, in a way that like impacts the practical experience for people? Yeah. So the way I like to explain it is that this modular architecture is the opposite of a monolithic architecture. This monolithic, this modular architecture in and of itself doesn't do anything different. It's exactly the same, but the difference is actually the properties that are derived from this architecture. So again, it's not the architecture itself um, because you could build like a modular blockchain that has the same exact constraints as a monolithic blockchain in theory, but it's the properties that you can get from it uh, that make it really, that give it those properties and those fields that are like, all right, this is scalable or this is allows for trust minimization, et cetera. Um, so yeah, the way you can think of it is basically like if you if you think of like a team of, I don't know, what's a good sport, like baseball, where everyone has to do everything, let's say, right? Like everyone has to take turns being the pitcher, everyone has to take turns doing this position, that position, everyone has to take turns hitting the ball, which I don't think that's how that works in real life. But let's just say, right? Everyone has to do everything. Um, when everyone does everything, naturally, you have to develop a team that is good at everything. And if you don't have a team that's good at everything, there are parts that aren't as performant on your team. So for example, if you have a really good pitcher, but you make him you know, not pitch eight out of 10 times because you want the other eight to also pitch, you're taking away like your what you're really good at. So the concept is kind of the same in blockchains where it's like, if you're building a blockchain like Ethereum, let's say, and you wanna do all four functions, you have to have a team that's good at all four functions. And you have to have a team that can do everything. Whereas if you, and also like another example I use is like, if you have, if you're in some sort of factory where like you're creating some product, you're packaging it, maybe you're like shipping it off, you're doing a bunch of stuff. When you're doing all of them, it's fine. But when you can specialize and you say, okay, instead of me like making the thing and then walking down and packaging it and then walking it down and putting the shipping label on, if I just am in charge of packing it and every time I see something, I put it in a box and just pass it down, I can be really efficient at my job and I can probably pack way more boxes per minute, let's say, than if I had to do the whole process by myself. So the same concept applies to blockchains where it's like, if you specialize, you can have teams that are specialized so that instead of having to be good at consensus, execution, settlement, and data availability, they can just be like, okay, we're just execution experts and we're gonna do this really well. And then what I was saying about the properties that get derived from it are, um, it's a lot of cool things like off team like clients that you can do, but basically without even getting too technical and, or too into the weeds, it's just like, you can get more specialization because you're worried about less things and you can just perform better on the one thing you're doing. I love that. Honestly, I had a whole conversation earlier today about how nobody is a good multitasker. Like, I mean, we can kind of fool ourselves into thinking that we can juggle a lot of things at one time, but usually that just means you do a lot of things kind of half-assed. Like <laughs> you do a lot of things mediocre um, or poorly even. And when you're able to focus on just a few things that, you know, you're super good at, um, or at least like one realm, then you have the space to execute with excellence, but also to think creatively about how the process could be improved. And um, it's really hard to find space to 
review and evaluate and think creatively about innovation when you're trying to juggle a whole lot going on. So I love that that's something that, that you're focusing on at Fuel. Um, let's shift into Latin American community development. Um, so, so Nikki, you you kind of joined our team recently, and you're kind of growing the the Latin American community outreach that we have at Metis. And um, Cami wrote this really beautiful essay about kind of like the the needs in the Latin American community and the opportunity there for developing in Web three. Um, so, let's talk a little bit, Cami, about about what you wrote, kind of like a summation of you know, the needs that are there and the resources that are needed. And then Nikki, maybe you can kind of chime in with your perspective as well. Yeah, so maybe for listeners, I'll just give a TLDR of the essay that I wrote. It's called The Dead End of Eurocentric Crypto. And it basically talks about how if we want to see true innovation in blockchain that leads to adoption for regular people, we need to shift our focus away from Europe and North America and start focusing on regions like Latin America, and I didn't mention Africa explicitly, but I also, you know, they fall into the same category of emerging regions that aren't having all of their needs met by their government and their infrastructure and their services so that there's an opportunity for crypto and blockchain to actually meet someone's needs versus in America and in Europe, it feels like <clears throat> we don't really have a good use for this and we're all kind of struggling to find out real use cases so much so that we end up inventing kind of silly things like we end up with things like crypto dick butts where, and I always use that example and everyone laughs, but it's true where it's like a bunch of rich crypto people like bought these NFTs and like thought it was so funny. And they did a gala where they all dressed up and they did a crypto dick butt gala where it's like, this is the kind of stuff that we end up with when we don't have things to really put our energy and minds towards. So if we want to do that and we want to see adoption, which is I think what everyone's working toward, we have to go to other regions that actually have problems that can be solved or at least made better with blockchain and crypto. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, Nikki, do you have anything to add on that front or um, you don't, no pressure ever. I just wanna make sure to leave the floor open and invite you into the conversation whenever you're ready. <laughs> no, yeah, um, I, I agree. Um, we, we really need to focus more in the emerging economies where age comes from. Um, well, I travel to, to Europe and I talk with people in, in the USA and well, I, I started uh, to, to understand crypto from there because there, there wasn't many information in Spanish or in the Latin community. So I started uh, to learn about crypto from the, the mainstream uh, diaries and podcasts and they all talk about uh, the, pers the perspective from the USA or the Europe. Um, they like the technology, but I don't think they really understand the needs of a uh, decentralized economy um, where, you can, where you can have the total control of your assets. Um, here in Latin America, we really do because we need to have it. You know, we, we have a history of uh, governments taking our money uh, without our consent. So we really understand what is to not have the control of what we have um, uh, to, to not be able to, to focus on, on our own economy. You know, like the, there is a lot of lack uh, of financial freedom here and financial education. So I think that if the talents uh, here in, in Latin America, that because we have a lot of talent, uh, focus on being, uh, making the, the blockchain better, but just with the needs we need, uh, the needs we need, like, um, just because, the, um, I don't know how to say it, sorry. If we, if we focus our own talents in the needs of Europe or USA, we are not doing something in, uh, something really in, innovative, we are doing something just fun, you know, like Ami said about the NFTs, or, or we are doing a, an NFT of a rock, like that's not, that doesn't change anything. But here in Latin America, I saw that there are a lot of uh, projects that are really working on 
making the the economy or the social uh, industry um, better with the blockchain you know like we use blockchain as a mean not as uh, as the end of something fun you know like we we use it to make better our life um i you know like there are four or five uh, countries that are in the top 30 countries in the in the 2022 of the use of cryptocurrency. So that's a thought about the use here in Argentina uh, or in, in other countries like Venezuela or Colombia. They are really using cryptocurrency to save themselves from the economy here. Um, I think that if we focus on that, uh, we could really make a, a, a change. Thank you for sharing. Um, so, so you both kind of mentioned the needs and, and kind of touched on resources needed. Largely, it was um, access to education and this lack of financial freedom. Um, but are there any other needs that you feel like maybe more specific that are bottlenecks um, or resources that are needed to really support the adoption? Uh, okay, sorry. Could you repeat that? <laughs> sorry. Yeah, sure. You both you both touched on um, the fact that there there's real need for for Web three in Latin American communities, and um, you kind of touched on there not being the resources there. So I was wondering if we could just be more specific about um, what is driving the need for blockchain adoption, and what resources do you see are like the biggest obstacles to that happening? I think. Uh, the ones, at least, that I touched on in my blog that are kind of the ones I know more about, but I'm sure there's more out there that I don't know about is the three that I touched on are like unstable and growing instability in the government and in the economy. The other one that I touched on was uh, remittance payments, which are basically cross-border payments. And the other one that I talked about was, what was the last category? Let me see. Uh, sorry, I don't remember. I wrote this so long ago now, and I've given so many uh, talks okay. on it. Yeah, I, I can see. I can know uh, why why you look for that. Um, that in in Latin America we have a lot of uh, inflation, so it's kind of like our our payments have an expi expiry date, and we need to expand it really fast because the there there won't be worth the same from when we received it um, at the, the end of the month. So cryptocurrency gives you uh, the, the opportunity to uh, exchange that money you have from, uh, for an asset that it will uh, be more stable. I mean, we are in a bear market. Um, the, the crypto assets are uh, in like, 80% uh, down from where they, they were, but they are still more stable than the Argentinian uh, peso, for example. Um, we we can't buy dollars as much as we want here, for example. And I know that there are other countries in, in Latin America that can't either. So we, we can only buy $200. And most of the people here uh, save their their money uh, with uh, dollars but if you can't buy more than 200 it's just like you are protecting only a part of what you want and you still don't have the fully control of uh, of your money because you cannot do what you want so with crypto they we have the opportunity to buy uh, dollars like crypto dollars we just use the UCC to protect ourselves from the inflation um, and also it kind of gives you the opportunity to learn more about the uh, financial world and um, you should not use it to save money you should you, you also use it to uh, take profit from it and that's when you came that's when the crypto assets came in right it's just not the, the stable uh, the stable coins Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the opportunity, the, the lack of access to financial tools that have a little bit more stability um, 
plus the, the opportunity to grow the assets uh, depending on whichever ones you're holding. Yeah, I think she hit all the slots. <laughs> yeah, cool, thank you. Okay, um, well, I didn't get to go to, to DevCon this year, um, but I heard that the just this, the general spirit um, was really high. And um, before we, we started recording, Kami, you mentioned that it, it did also feel a little bit like a crypto bubble. Um, I would love to hear both of your perspectives on kind of the enthusiasm behind uh, communities in Latin America for crypto adoption and um, ways that projects can more directly engage with the people that they're trying to serve. Yeah, I'll just speak quickly and then I think Nicole has more to say anyway, because she actually is living, was living there. Um, but I would say like, at least for what we're doing at Fuel, we're just trying to be really inclusive of all regions and keeping things in mind of like, okay, if you're doing all the conferences in Europe and Asia, let's say people from Latin America, it's way more expensive for them to travel because of the, you know, like their currency, but also just the income that they make. It's just not feasible to be spending like one to $2,000 per conference to go around. So it's like, how do we create opportunities and events and conferences for them so that they can still grow their ecosystem, we can grow our ecosystem, but that they don't have to like break the bank or be rich to participate. Um, so I think in general, that's just an example, but I think in general, just like being mindful of things like that is something that a lot of teams don't do now. So if you just start doing them, it's a step in the right direction. Nikki, anything to add on that front? Yeah, um, I think that we we need to focus on the needs of the community to to build actual things that are needed in the ecosystem, not just things that uh, okay, that look good. You know, it's uh, kind of like um, it was a time when everyone was to put blockchain in everything that already exists. Um, not everything that is in Web two can be in Web three, and that that kind of happens when you don't uh, focus on the on the needs of the people that are going to use it you know that are going to use the, you know, the technology that are going to use the, your project so i i believe that the companies need to really listen um what people want um uh, here in argentina we have a big community of crypto we there is events every week um these events are not just Ten people that mostly are hundreds of people and so on. We have a big community that's the DeFi Latin and they did events for 700 people. So there is a lot of um, persons that are really into crypto and that are really uh, want to, that really want to to leave the ecosystem and to use it for uh, the day uh, the normal days, right? Like the they just don't want to use it just uh, to be addition and <laughs> buy hundreds of NFTs. They want to use it to buy the, the groceries because of what we've been talking about. So I I know that there are a lot of com companies here that are really uh, hearing that they are really listening to the to the people and are bringing the the solutions for it. So I I think that companies really need to to focus on that and just not to to do the actions for the um, the community because they have to do it they really need to um build their mission around it you know like for example metis um, wants to do the blockchain accessible uh, for everyone uh, that's a need we need uh, that's uh something we need to to grow and um, to make uh, a mass adoption for for the blockchain technology so you move and the actions you take are going for that mission. But if you, if your mission is just to be the biggest uh, NFT collection, um, you say that you're moving for the, for the community, but the things you say and the things you do don't uh, collide, then it's just something with you're doing to, to, to sold out your collection and not for the community. Yeah, thank you for sharing. So just in general, we need to align our actions with our, our intentions and um, 
if we if we say that we have these mission driven focuses, then um, you know what are we actually doing to engage with the people that we say that we're serving, and are we working towards solutions for them rather than notoriety or you know popularity, money, that kind of thing? Um, thank you so much for sharing. Um, is are there any other topics that you guys want to touch on, or anything that you want to? kind of drop to share with the audience before we close our call for today yeah maybe one thing is like um for the people in latin america fuel lab specifically is going to be working on a lot of cool stuff next year focusing on latin america so i can't share anything yet but just to keep in touch follow fuel labs at fuel labs underscore or me at can be in the same where we'll be talking about kind of these plans in the near future that brings a lot of cool stuff to latin america Cool. I'll be sure to, to drop those uh, links in the notes as well so people can find you on Twitter. All right. Well, thank you both so much for, for having this call with me today. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to share and i um, looking forward to sharing this with our audience. And um, yeah, that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ash, for the invitation. Thank you. Um, Tommy, it was a pleasure to share it with you. Thank you.